This morning, uh, we're, we're going to do something a little different. Uh, we come to the book of John, chapter 3, this morning with... Uh, we, we come to this conversation with, with Nicodemus. And so we're asking this morning, who is Nicodemus, really? Uh, we want to get kind of a character sketch. He, he appears three times in this gospel, uh, here in chapter 3, and then, and then in, in the later chapters, as we'll get to in a few moments. And so we want to take a moment and just uh, take this time and, and kind of get a brief character sketch of who Nicodemus is, who Nicodemus was, and, and what his plan is. And so, by way of introduction this morning, we're going, I want to share with you this scene here in chapter 3 that John describes for us, but I want to, I want to give you a description of this scene by author and pastor Max Lucado. Max writes, he's waiting for the shadows. Darkness will forward the cover he covets. So he waits for the safety of nightfall. He sits near the second floor window of his house, sipping olive leaf tea, watching the sunset and biding his time. Jerusalem enchants at this hour. The disappearing sunlight tints the stone streets, gilds the white horses, and highlights the block, the block, the temple block. Nicodemus looks across the slate roofs at the massive square, gleaming and resplendent. He walked across his, across his courtyard this morning, and he'll do it again tomorrow. You gather with religious leaders, and you do what religious leaders do. They discuss God, and so does Nicodemus here. They discuss reaching God, pleasing God, appeasing God. Pharisees conversed about God, and Nicodemus sits among them, debating, pondering, solving puzzles, resolving dilemmas, sandal tying on the Sabbath, feeding people who work, divorcing your wife, dishonoring your parents. What does God say? Nicodemus needs to know. It's his job. He's a holy man and leaves holy men his name on the elite list of Torah scholars. He dedicated his life to the law and occupies one of the 71 seats of the Judean Supreme Court. He has credentials, clout, and questions. Questions for this Galilean crowd stopper. This teacher who lacks diplomas, yet he attracts people. Who has ample time for the happy hour crowd, a little time for clergy and the holy upper crust. So Nicodemus comes at night. His colleagues can't know of the meeting. They wouldn't understand. Nicodemus can't wait until they do. And as the shadows darken the city, he steps out, slips unseen through the cobbled winding streets. He passes servants lighting lamps in the courtyards and, and takes a path that ends at the door of a simple house. Jesus and his followers are staying here, he's been told. So Nicodemus knocks. The noisy room silences as he enters. The men are wharf workers and tax collectors, unaccustomed to the highbrow world of the scholar. They shift in their seats, and Jesus motions for the guests to sit. Nicodemus does and initiates the most famous conversation in the Bible. So that's the scene Max Lucado sets for us as we approach John 3, 1 through 9 this morning. But Nicodemus kind of follows a path similar to those of, of maybe many of us. We sought truth, right? We seek truth. We seek to know what this truth that the Bible says, you know, we seek to know if it's real. Maybe some of us are just seeking truth, period. And then maybe we move 
maybe a, a, a baby step forward, maybe, maybe just a tiny step forward, and, and we become a defender. It may, it may not be an apologetic defense of faith necessarily, but it might, it might be say, well, wait a minute. Maybe I need to give this Jesus guy a chance. And then eventually that leads us to becoming a believer ourselves. And I think that's the path that Nicodemus follows. But before we jump in to our text in John chapter 3, will you join with me for a word of prayer? Father God, we come today worshiping and glorifying your name. And Lord, as we come into this time, this, this time of your word, Lord, I pray you would move me out of the way, that your spirit would lead us, teach us, and guide us this morning. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray that, that your spirit would indeed teach us what we need to know. Father, we thank you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. In John chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 1 through 9, we're going to be looking at a couple different passages this morning. But the first one is, is chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. And we're going to spend a little bit more time unpacking this text next week. But, but again, we just kind of want to get a character sketch of who this Nicodemus person is. And so in John chapter 3, verse 1, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And do not marvel what I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus says, how can these things be? Now, these, this isn't on the slide, I don't think, but verse 10. Notice verse 10 with me. Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? You're the teacher of Israel. You don't get it. Nicodemus, in this text, we, we can understand kind of the context here that Nicodemus is a wealthy man. He's a ruler of the Jews, and, and this title connects him with the Jewish elite, a group called the Sanhedrin. It's the most powerful ruling body of the Jewish nation. I, I kind of have it pictured in my head, you know, we have two houses of Congress, right? We have the House of Representatives, the lower chamber, and the upper cham the chamber called the what? So the Senate. Right. So kind of that more elite crowd of congressmen called the Senate. And so here it is here. We have the Pharisees, and out of the Pharisees come the ruling elite, the Sanhedrin, a smaller crowd, if you will, but they have more power. And so we know a little bit about the Pharisees, including that they were fanatically religious. Yet according to Jesus' responses here in chapter 3, they were no nearer to the kingdom of God than a prostitute is. They're not. They, they know things. They're very intelligent and they're very smart. But they're no nearer the kingdom of God See, their philosophy included adhering to more than 600 laws, many of which were simply the invention of the Pharisees. Now, 
what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you a couple examples. For example, they believe that it was all right to swallow vinegar on the Sabbath, but not to gargle it, because gargling constituted labor. Another example held that it was permissible to eat, to eat an egg that had been laid on the Sabbath only. Okay, so you can eat the egg. It was laid on the Sabbath. That's great. You can eat it. But only if the chicken was killed on the next day for having violated the Sabbath. So, so go home and tell your chickens. Hey, okay, follow me. Go home and tell your chickens. No laying eggs on Saturday. That's the Sabbath. Right? Jewish Sabbath. No laying eggs on Saturday. See, see how well a response you get, right? They'll still lay eggs on a Saturday. So there were, there were a lot of laws that the Pharisees tried to abide by. So the bottom line is, Nicodemus comes from a world of good efforts, sincere gestures, maybe even good motivations and hard work. In other words, give it a best shot, and God will do the rest. Nicodemus comes to Jesus with a, a certain amount of respect, because he calls the teacher rabbi. Now, rabbi, of course, means teacher. It's similar to us calling someone by their prefix, maybe, for instance, professor, or doctor, or reverend. Sometimes as a joke, my wife will call me Reverend Husband. Uh, <clears throat> but he takes the respect further, saying, now notice what he says, okay? Because this is important. He takes this respect further by saying, we know that you have come from God. Now that's a key word there, from. He's not saying that Jesus is God. There's a difference. But that you come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. And that's kind of a problem. That all the all major or a lot of major religions acknowledge Jesus as a godly man, a righteous man, someone maybe even from God. He is a wise teacher, even a great prophet. But that leaves the story of Jesus incomplete. Because the, the question that we have to come to, and the, and the realization that we have to come to, is see, Jesus claimed to be God. Period. Jesus claimed to be God. He didn't merely say, I'm from God. He didn't merely say that, uh, that, that I'm here to teach you or I'm here to be a prophet. He says, I am God. And to believe anything less is to, to put into question his deity. And to call him anything less is to call into question his deity. We have to either accept Jesus for who he is, or we acknowledge him to be a liar, or we just call him a lunatic and he doesn't know what he's doing. Those are the three choices that we have to come when we come face to face with the Jesus of Nazareth, the Jesus who died on the cross for the sins of the world. When we come face to face with the truth that he gives us in his scripture, we have to come to the question, who is Jesus? And that's something, I think that's the main question that, that John answers for us in his gospel. Who is this Jesus? And that's exactly what Nicodemus is trying to figure out. Who is this Jesus? And in this instance, this is the first of Jesus' one-on-one -on -one evangelistic encounters, uh, encounters recorded in the gospels. And it's, it's really ironic, uh, if you think about it, that Jesus, who so often confronted the Pharisees and their unbelief, and even their outright antagonism, began his evangelistic ministry by answering a leading Pharisee who approached him with an enthusiastic word of affirmation. But maybe Jesus sensed something in his heart. 
See, if Jesus is God, he can sense that. The other Pharisees, they don't get it. He's going to attack them because they're attacking God's truth. Nicodemus is trying to learn. And we notice, too, that Nicodemus calls Jesus teacher. Okay, great. So what? I'm glad you asked. So what? Because this was the correct term for disciples to employ. So right off the bat, Nicodemus is seeking to learn more about this Jesus. He's saying, get it, I get it, man. I know who you are. I've done my homework, and your work impresses me. I get it. You're, you're, you're a, a great guy of some degree or another. And you know what? In our culture, we might think, or we might think of an appropriate comeback would be, hey, I've heard of you too. <laughs> you know, kind of trade, trade affirmations with each other. I, I've heard of you too. You're a good guy yourself. But yet that doesn't come. Jesus makes no mention of his elite status. He makes no mention of, of the good credentials of Nicodemus. He doesn't, even, he doesn't even give credit to his good intentions. Now, it's not to say that Nicodemus doesn't have these, but in the scheme of Jesus' mission here on earth, it simply doesn't matter. Those good intentions don't matter. We're reminded of, of verses like Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, by grace are you saved through. And that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, let's say man should know. Good intentions don't matter when it comes to salvation. Instead, Jesus gets right to the point, and he pulls no punches. He directly tells him, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Now, when Nicodemus heard this, his, his head must have gone into a fall. Nicodemus and the Pharisees believed that good works could earn salvation, and, they, and he probably expected Jesus to commend him for those good works. Instead, Jesus confronted him with the futility of his religion. And I think that's a good reminder for us. Religion is futile. It's the relationship that counts. Religion is futile. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ that counts. And in all, Jesus was calling Nicodemus to a, a spiritual rebirth, basically telling him to acknowledge his own insufficiency and, and turn away from everything that he was committed to. We see an example of another seeker in the encounter with the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus had asked this rich and young ruler to turn away from all that he knew, to turn away from all of his property, all of his money, and to give everything up and follow him. And he said, okay, Jesus, I will. Right? Wrong. He walked away from Jesus because he could not, or at least felt that he could not do what Jesus had demanded him do. <laughs> so in all, Jesus says to the seeker that he must be purified spiritually and, and, and reborn spiritually. See, Nicodemus understood that even in his adherence to religious law and practice, including baptism, that he himself could not grant eternal life. We see his shock begin to surface when he says in verse 9, but, but how can these things be? Christ's response says, are you the teacher of Israel? 
Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? Nicodemus, in your office, you've got 16 diplomas behind your name, and yet you don't understand these things. You've got all this education, and yet you don't understand these things. It was a rebuke, and it completely silenced Nicodemus. He, according to our text, made no further inquiry, no further response. And, and maybe, perhaps he listened to Jesus explain the new birth, or, or perhaps he just, he just left in anger. We're not told. But however, silence would be understandable considering his aptitude as a teacher was just challenged. Right? It's almost like saying, you idiot! You should know! But what Jesus is telling Nicodemus is that the Bible, which on our end makes up the Old and New Testament, is perfectly unified, and the way of salvation is the same in both Old and New Testaments. Salvation was never a reward for human works. It has always been a gift of grace for repentant sinners, made possible only by the grace of God. It was a gift to those who humbly and by faith sought redemption from their sin. Jesus even alludes to, to his crucifixion and his resurrection and the salvation that will be offered through him once and for all. The idea of a new birth was something Nicodemus should have understood because he was a teacher of Israel. So then at the end of this episode, we have Nicodemus. He saw the signs. Perhaps even saw the turning of water into wine at the wedding at Cana. He acknowledged that Jesus was from God and, and even perhaps his mind accepted to some extent the truth of Christ. But at this point, he walks away from Jesus as an unbelieving seeker. How many, I wonder, of us how many of us know people who are seeking truth? How many of us are, or how many of us know people who are seeking the truth? I mean, we all seek truth in some form or fashion. For some people, they say, well, there is no absolute truth. Well, that's all well and good, but you just contradicted yourself with an absolute truth. You just contradicted yourself. To say there is no absolute truth is in itself an absolute. We all seek truth to some degree or another. And as believers, we have a responsibility and an obligation of what we even call a great commission to tell others about the truth of which we have been granted. The truth about which we've seen. Now, while we may not be seeking the truth like, like an unbeliever, like, like someone like Nicodemus would be, we know people who are. And we must tell them about what Jesus has done in our lives. Because see, that's what, that's what Jesus does here. Jesus says, now let me tell you what this rebirth is about and what it means to you. So we see Nicodemus as a seeker. But next we see him as a defender. If you want to flip with me over to John chapter 7, verse 45. John chapter 7, verse 45. And we can even back up to, to verse 44. Some of them uh, wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. See, Jesus was, was causing a division among the people. Uh, and... And, and so there was a, a division among the people, and some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. Verse 45, the officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? And the officers, the officers answered, well, no one ever spoke like this man. 
The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any, now notice this question, verse 40, 48, have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Verse 50. This is why the, the question is important. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law not judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And they replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arise from Galilee. Nicodemus stood up, defended this Jesus. So now follow me here for a few minutes. We're going to walk quickly through these chapters from chapter 3 to verse 7, or chapter 7. In chapter 4, Jesus left Judea, went into Galilee. In chapter 5, John reports the feast of the Jews. So Jesus then goes back to Jerusalem. And in verse 18, the Jews were seeking to kill him, basically for charges of blasphemy. In chapter 6, the 5,000 are fed, and he calls himself the bread of life, which causes the Jews to take him literally. The Pharisees, which are, which are in John, in the book of John, the Jews. The Jews return, refers to the Pharisees and the, the Jewish religious leadership. Take him literally. We saw that in chapter 3. How can a man be reborn? Can he go back into his mother's womb and be born again? That's not what Jesus did. Same thing with the bread of life. They take him literally. So we're going to eat this man's flesh? So they grumble about him saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They took him with them. And now in chapter 7, the Jews were seeking to capture and kill him at the feast. And there were rumors going around about him according to verse 12, but no one spoke openly. Why? They were scared of the religious leadership. But then in verse 14, he gets up in the midst of the feast, maybe even on top of a picnic table, and begins to teach during the feast. And that astonishes the Jews. That astonishes the leadership. But we notice in verse 30 that they were seeking to kill him, but they could not lay their hands on him. Why? Because his time had not yet come. And then, chapter 7, again, verses 32 to 36, the Pharisees and the chief priests had sent officers out to seize him, and at the same time could not understand why he is saying that he will go somewhere where no one can find him. So we're, we're trying to get you, but we can, and you're saying that you're going to go somewhere, and we can find you. What are you talking about? And then more rumors in verses 40 and 42 uh, the degree in which the crowd division occurred, again, they tried to seize him, but no one could lay their hands on him. And so the dejected officers go back to the Pharisees without Christ. And when they question him why they did not bring him, notice their response. Notice the soldier's response in verse 46. Never has a man spoken in this way. Pharisees' response says, you, you've been led astray. But yet, the Pharisees' further response in verse 48 proves interesting because they ask that, well, you, you don't see that any of the rulers or the Pharisees have believed in him, has he? And then they continue, but this crowd, which is not, uh, which does not know the law, is accursed. The, the little people, see all the leadership, that they're saying the leadership, well, we've arrived. Essentially. We've arrived. None of us has believed in, but these, these little people, these, 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 these people who, who, these normal people who believe in him, well, they don't know the law, and therefore they're accursed. Yet Nicodemus 
And John notes for us, he was one of them, one of the, one of the Pharisees, one of the Sanhedrin, comes back into the picture. And in verse 51, he says, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing. Does it? In other words, in, in, in our justice system vernacular, if you will, he's innocent until proven guilty. Nicodemus calls out his fellow Pharisees on a basic matter of legal procedure which had been accepted by Moses and all of the Jewish interpreters. And so here is Nicodemus who approached Christ at night and now here he is defending Christ. Now, now he's defending Christ on a very basic and simple legal matter, but he is still defending In John 3, we saw Nicodemus coming to Christ, showing respect as a teacher who could only be from God. And through the previous three chapters, we saw the Jews questioning over and over who this man was and their desire to kill him. And perhaps Nicodemus heard of the healing in Bethesda. Perhaps he was in the group of the Jews in chapter 5 when Jesus placed himself as equal with God. Perhaps Nicodemus heard about the 5,000 that were fed and maybe, maybe even how he walked on water. And maybe even more likely, Nicodemus was there when Jesus boldly stepped into the temple and began to teach during the feast, during the time the Pharisees wanted to kill him. And so Nicodemus has some history here. And, and he comes away from chapter 3 with a thought process of, okay, I've, I've really got to figure out who this Jesus is. This, this isn't an ordinary man. Who is this Jesus? And, and again, John writes in his book, uh, he gives a great uh, answer to that question as we go through the book of John. He unpacks that question, who is this Jesus? That's one of the reasons why he wrote his book. In fact, he tells us just that towards the end of his book. These things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So that's his desire, is to show us who this Jesus is, that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And so Nicodemus here steps forward and defends Christ before his peers. And, and they were obviously unaware that any of their number would even have the audacity to defend this man. I mean, just look at their question. None of us have believed in him, have we? And yet here come, whoa, wait a minute, Nicodemus is doing what? What's his problem? And notice their twofold response. Are you some kind of Galilean peasant? Are you ignorant of the scriptures? So now Nicodemus has had his aptitude challenged twice. <laughs> once by Jesus and once by his peers. But even though Nicodemus didn't come to the defense of Christ, maybe as a Perry Mason, which I think is before many people, before most of our crowd here, before their time, uh, or Matlock, maybe before they would have, but he still, he still did defend the Messiah. And this alone was dangerous on Nicodemus' part. After all, in the previous three chapters, the Pharisees were seeking to, to seize Jesus and kill him for blasphemy. Notice John 5.18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father and making himself equal with God. So how could one of the Pharisees, one of our own, they said, how could one of our own step forward and even think about defending this guy? This guy who calls himself God. 
Nicodemus says, doesn't, doesn't he deserve a fair trial? He deserves to be heard. But what about us? What about the church? What about believers? Do we defend Christ at all? 1 Peter 3.15 challenges us when Peter says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, with a sense of, of grace, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So then, are we ready, are you ready, to stand up for our Lord? Are we willing to put our lives on the line in defense of our faith? And I firmly believe that is where our nation is heading. It could very well, within the next generation, cost you your life if you acknowledge publicly that Jesus is your Savior. I think, I believe, we are heading that way. So do we publicly defend Christ? Are we willing to step forward and say, hey, wait a minute. This is my Jesus. I think However, most of us probably need to get on our faces before God and beg His forgiveness because we do not even defend Him when a crude joke is said. We do not defend Him when our neighbor asks us, hey, where do you go on Sundays? Most of us probably just need to beg our forgiveness beg forgiveness of our Heavenly Father. So, we saw in chapter 3 Nicodemus being a seeker. And, and we just saw how he was a defender. He came to Christ's defense in chapter 7. Now turn with me to chapter 19 where we see for the third and final time Nicodemus in the book of John. Verse 19, or chapter 19, verse 38. Jesus had been tried, beaten, crucified, and Jesus was dead. And after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, verse 38, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And, and Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day, verse 42, of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. As I've said, this is the third time that Jesus, the third and final time that we see Nicodemus in the book of John, and, and indeed throughout Scripture, this is the last time we see him. He moves from being a closet seeker in chapter 3 to a Sanhedrin member who defended him in hopes of a fair judgment in chapter 7 to a person who is willing to make a declarative statement through the burial of Jesus' body. This text and the one before this explicitly, explicitly recall the reader to the first occasion in which he appeared in chapter 3. Both texts say this is the one who came to Jesus by night. Right? This is the one, if you recall, John says in chapter 3, this is the one, this is the, the same guy who came to Jesus by now. Here, Nicodemus and Joseph take the body of Jesus to prepare it for burial. 
linen shrouds were part of an, an honorable burial, especially for the righteous. And spices were used not, not to preserve the body, but to diminish the stench and to pay final respects to the deceased. Now, you notice that Nicodemus brought spices and myrrh. And by Roman standards, a pound was about 12 ounces. And so by our figures, as, as a lot of the newer translations will tell you, we're looking at 75 pounds of spices. That's a lot of spices. That's a lot of spices. It was an extraordinary amount. As one commentator put it, the lavish amount of spices befits a king. And Nicodemus lavishly honored as Jesus as true king in his burial. And this lavish sacrifice illustrates how secret believers can, can emerge as disciples committed to Jesus. And sometimes even more committed than those who had followed him through his ministry openly. And at this point were in secret. Because you know, if you've read the Gospels, you understand that they abandoned Jesus in his time of need. And yet here's Jesus having been crucified on a cross, suspended dead. And Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus openly on a hill called Golgotha, openly lower Jesus from that being maybe, maybe with a call similar to this. Lower Jesus to the ground to prepare his body for burial. Out in the open. And yet, all of those who had followed Jesus openly and publicly were hiding. Now, now the book of John, now to be fair, John the Apostle, if, if we know a uh, chapter before this, John was with Mary, and Jesus had said, essentially, take my mother as your own. And so John was probably taking Mary back to the house, getting the tables ready for the fried chicken and the green beans. That was fun. Well, he was probably consoling Mary, right? He wasn't necessarily in hiding. And so Joseph, a secret disciple of Jesus, and, and Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, were rendering a service to Jesus that has every potential of being dangerous. Even, even Jesus' own disciples were hiding. But to some extent, Jesus, or excuse me, Nicodemus is showing a willingness to to follow Jesus no matter the cost, at least to some extent. And our text does not explicitly say that Nicodemus was a believer, but yet we do see a progression. In chapter 3, he became, or he came to Jesus by night in secret. In chapter 7, he defended Christ, however subtly, to his peers <coughs> in, in a room full of, of hostile unbelievers. Nicodemus has stepped forward and defended Christ. And now, here in chapter 19, he openly risks his reputation further and his security to properly honor Christ. It would seem to me that Nicodemus was stepping out of the darkness and into light. Now, <clears throat> Again, our text here does not mention Nicodemus being a believer. However, church history does mention Nicodemus again. Christian tradition says that he was baptized by Peter and John. He suffered persecution from hostile Jews. He lost his membership in the Sanhedrin. And he was forced to leave Jerusalem because of his Christian faith. So according to tradition, Nicodemus counted the cost. He understood what it meant to follow Christ. He became a believer and he was persecuted. 
But that comes back to us. Are we willing to follow Jesus no matter the cost? Again, there may come a day when honoring Jesus publicly means death. And certainly, in other countries today, Christians are being persecuted on a daily basis to the point of death. And even though we don't experience that type of persecution, let me ask you a question. Are you willing to be made fun of for your faith? Are you willing to be bullied for what you believe? Because that may happen. So as we ponder these things, I also, as we close, I want to ask the question, where do we go from here? Bart Ehrman is the, the religion professor at, uh, at UNC Chapel Hill. He, he's a very, very well-known author. Uh, he teaches New Testament there at UNC. And he calls himself a happy agnostic. Whatever that means. He used to be an evangelistic uh, believer. Used to, used to tell people about the gospel. Was, was joyful about his faith. And has since become what he calls a happy agnostic. Well, at Chapel Hill, he begins his, his semester in New Testament with a class of 300 students. And he asks three basic questions. Now, I copied this off of his blog, okay? So, Dr. Ehrman, if you're watching, I apologize. But I wanted to make a First question, he says, how many of you in here would agree with the proposition that the Bible is the inspired Word of God? And he says, Phew, every hand in the place goes up. 300 students, hands go up everywhere. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. Yes, thank God. He says, okay, great. Now, how many of you have read the Harry Potter series? Phew, every hand goes up. His hands up. He says, Great. He says, and now, how many of you have read the entire Bible? And he says, very few hands go up. Very few hands go up. He says, then I'd laugh for a minute and say, okay, so I'm not telling you that I think the Bible is the inspired word of God. But you're telling me that you think it is. And he says, I can see why you would want to read a book by J.K. Rowling. It's action-packed. It's got a lot of good stuff in it, a lot of themes, uh, a, lot of, a lot of characters and, and character buildup and everything else. I can see why you might want to read a book by J.K. Rowling. He says, but if God wrote a book, wouldn't you want to see what he had to say? Church, if we can't read the Bible, what we consider God's inspired word, if we're not reading to willing to read the totality of it and to study it, how are we going to stand up for it? But further, do we step out in an effort to defend our faith to our next door neighbors? I mean, in this day and age, I think maybe the better question is to ask, do we even know our next door neighbors? <laughs> Much less share with them. When someone makes a crude joke about our Lord, do we come to his defense? Or do we just kind of laugh along and write it out? <clears throat> Are we consistently abiding in Christ through prayer time and study of the Word of God so that we are then prepared to give a reason for the hope that is within us? But see, the fact of the matter is, most of us don't say a word. 
Most of us don't even say a word about Jesus. When the Lord gives us the opportunity to share the life-saving, death-dissolving power of the gospel, most of us do not even approach the subject with our neighbors. Instead, we change the subject to talking about our spouses or talking about the last ball game. We do nothing to tell them about Jesus. And folks, we tell people, we tell each other that, hey, wait a minute. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And yet we don't say anything. When, Je when Jesus gives us a point blank opportunity to share the gospel, we don't say a word. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that picture? So I think the ultimate question today is what makes us so ashamed of the gospel? What makes us so ashamed? We would rather talk about each other and spread rumors about each other. We're really good at that than talk about Jesus. There is something detrimentally wrong with that picture. What makes us so ashamed of the gospel? Will you stay with me for prayer? Father, we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that we would take seriously your call to make more of you, to make more of you in our lives, to make more of you in our conversations with people, to make more of Jesus. discern and trying to figure out who this Jesus is. Lord, I pray that you would, you would remove the shackles off their eyes Father, that you would show them who you are and who your son is and that they would come to faith in you right here. Father, we thank you for your word. We praise you So as we start this invitation time, Anthony and Lou and I will stand down front if you want to pray with someone. Have you come to grips of knowing who Jesus is? Do you know who Jesus is? This Jesus who claims to be God, have you accepted Him as your Lord and Savior?